Hi everyone, it's Julia and welcome back to my channel. Is that a thing I say? Uh, I don't know. Today we are here to do my February wrap up. This one's not too shabby. I managed to read 11 books in February. Three were physical hold in your hand novels, four were ebooks, and four were audiobooks. That's math. Um, one of those four ebooks was a graphic novel. Let's dive in. If this is your first wrap up of mine, I start with my lowest rated book and work my way up to the highest. So these are not the order in which I read them, but the order in which I prefer them. <laughs> so in the month of February, my TBR was inspired by Kayla from Books and Lala. I was absolutely obsessed with her closet on haul project while she was doing it. I um, sadly don't have enough hauls tracking my buying on my channel or honestly I would probably be doing that as well um, but I did have one from February two years ago I believe 2018 or 2017 um, and I will link that up above so you can see me hauling most of these books I did a really good job of sticking with it oh my gosh um, and that's where this TBR came from Sadly, though, one of those books was a DNF, my first DNF of 2020. Wow, who knew? So this is It's a Bad, 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 Bad World by Curtis M. Lawson. It's very small. You would think, Julia, just give it a try. It's so tiny. Um, I did not like. I made it, let's see, maybe 20 pages in. No, I made it 10 pages in. Oh no, <laughs> no, Curtis, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh boy. So this is inspired by It's a Mad, 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 Mad World, um, or Rat Race, if you're more familiar with that classic 90s movie. Um, and it's about all of these criminals, like an assassin and a pair of serial killer lovers and a dirty cop. And they're all trying to get this magical treasure thing that has been stolen. <sighs> I cannot get into this. This is definitely one of those books that belongs in the genre that I previously talked about in my January wrap-up. That is books by men, written for men. I moved where my light was because it just seemed unbalanced. Maybe it still is. I just could not get into this. I mean, literally the first scene, we have someone being attacked while at a urinal, and I'm like, this is already, it's a no from me, dog. Um, and also, there was a scene just after that, I mean, coming from a guy, I'm not here to judge people, but coming from a guy who looks like this, I don't want to read a scene about a black man, like, belittling other black men like shut it down don't like it so I just felt uncomfortable and not like I was going to enjoy myself and so I said goodbye <laughs> okay of the books that I actually completed first up at 2.2 stars we have Foulis Fair by Hannah Capen um, I just filmed an entire review of this. It took me a half an hour of rambling. Hopefully I can make it coherent. Um, I'll link that because I think that's going to go up first. But let's just say, as a fan of Macbeth, oh no, sweetie, what is you doing? I don't know. It just, it felt messy. It felt not fully thought out. It felt like there were so many better ways that this story could have been interpreted in a modern setting. And I had some, in my opinion, pretty good fixes about how the play, or not the play, the book could have been great. But those didn't happen, so I'm salty. Moving on. Other than Foul is Fair, I didn't actually, like, actively hate anything I read this month, so that's good. Um, first up... This is one I actually listened to. Could you see that the entire time? 
So this is one I actually listen to as an audiobook, but do own. Um, it's The Hazelwood by Melissa Albert. Cover is so pretty, come on. This green one is the Owl Crate edition. The original cover is black instead of green. Um, so I gave this 3.4 stars. It wasn't like bad. I actually didn't really think it suffered from the pacing issues that other people seemed to complain about. A lot of people thought it was like too long in the real world and then not enough time in the hinterlands. I actually really didn't mind it. I thought the real world buildup like had a good pacing to it and it made sense because like that's what this book was about. It was about this girl being like, my grandma wrote this book. Oh my god, these things may be real. <laughs> so like, I liked the discovery of all of that and the realizations she made along the way. Um, the only weird pacing part, in my opinion, was uh, the... What's her... What's the fairy tale called? The Alice. Was like the Alice three times part at the end. I was like, oh, this is going really fast all of a sudden. <laughs> like, we're just skipping over it. Okay. Okay, it's fine. Um... Also, a lot of people complain about a scene in which Alice is talking back to a cop and her friend is like, hey, will you shut up? I'm black and I really don't want to be involved in this police drama. Thanks. Would love to not die today. Um, but I thought it was handled well in the book because like he, what's his name? Finch? Uh, this was like one of the first books. Yeah, Ellery Finch. Like Finch gets mad at her and she's like, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm dumb. I don't know why I did that. Like, they talk about it. It doesn't just, like, get glazed over and they move on. It's a part of the story. So, didn't mind that either. Frankly, this was fine to me. I just don't feel that invested in it. Definitely not enough to read the second book, but 100% will read the actual short stories, Tales from the Hinterlands, because that's coming out. <sighs> that I will super duper read. Okay. At the same rating of 3.4 stars, I have another audiobook. It's Tempest by Beverly Jenkins. This was cute. We all know I love any plot line with parents. I just think it's cute. So Tempest is a historical romance novel um, with black protagonists. <laughs> oh, diversity. Pew, 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 pew. Black History Month. Um, so what am I saying about it? <laughs> so Tempest is a historical fiction novel set in the Old West. Um, I forget specifically where. I know Regan comes from Arizona, but I forget exactly where she moves to. Maybe Wyoming. I might have made that up. Um, but so she's a mail order bride and when she arrives there are these outlaws and then the posse that's following the outlaws is not outlaws, and she accidentally shoots the man she's supposed to marry in the shoulder. <laughs> so, we love a meet cute. <laughs> um, but no, it actually, it, I, I really liked their relationship. I thought it grew nicely. Uh, I thought it was like just a very genuine, sweet relationship. Also, the male love interest, Colt, has a daughter who, um, like, he's a widower, and his daughter is so cute and so sweet, and I loved her, and I loved her relationship with Regan. We know I love a mother character, um, including stepmothers, and so, yeah, I definitely loved the family, and I thought the romance aspect worked really well. The reason that this didn't score so highly for me was just some, like, weird things, like, first of all, there were about 60 antagonists in this book. Like, there was the neighbor who wanted to get with Colt and was pissed that he wasn't marrying her. There was uh, Regan's ex who just shows up out of the blue and shows up one more time out of the blue and that's it. There's uh, Colton's aunt, Minnie. She's technically his uh, aunt-in-law, his deceased wife's aunt um who like wants to take his daughter away to the east with her um who else there's the outlaws there's someone who mysteriously shoots at reagan in the beginning of the novel and is not heard from from a very long time um there's a one-eyed cougar <laughs> there's like a wild cat named one eye 
running around these parts. And is there anyone else? Oh, there's like a scene where all these Chinese immigrants are attacked. So it's not a main antagonist, but it is like, oh my God, poor guys. Um, so that's like a lot of people to keep track of, right? I thought so. Um, and I was like, okay, you can't all be the conflict. That's too many conflicts. Um, it turns out a lot of them actually kind of meshed together in the end in a really weird way, which I didn't really like. So I was like, kudos for trying to make all those work, but it was, it was too much. We didn't need all of them. So that was just odd. And also, this is like a weird thing for romance, and it's not like I'm someone who is like, I'm reading this for all the sexy scenes. But like the farther the book went, the less specific and less graphic, I guess, the like romance scenes got between Regan and Colton. And I was like, Shouldn't it be the opposite? Shouldn't it be like the closer you grow together, the more meaningful those interactions are? Where it was like, by the end, it was like, and I had sex. And then the next day, and I'm like, what? Like, that was weird to me. But it was a cute book. I'd recommend it if it sounds interesting to you. Okay, next up, <laughs> barely a difference. We have at 3.5 stars, uh, The Walking Dead, volume three. I'm going to continuously be talking about The Walking Dead and keeping it, I'm sure, in this three-star range because as much as I love these characters, oh my god, the choices that these writers made will piss me off till the end of time. <laughs> so The Walking Dead Volume 3, they're all in this prison hanging out. It's a really cool setting. Um, all of the female character development pretty much goes out the window. We get it. You hate women. It's cool. Um, Lori's entire plot line is, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. I'm so crazy. Oh my god, pregnancy hormones, which, like, hormones are a real thing that exists, but chill. Um, I just, I can't even, like, remember Maggie's, Maggie's entire plot line, um, if having sex with someone is a character trait, then Maggie has one character trait in the comics. Good for her. Um, there's some real b BS about to go down with Carol. I just know this and I'm scared. Um, poor Andrea, plus her heart, is like the strongest, most complex female character in the comics. And <laughs> they just really wanted to take her down a peg in this volume. Oh my god. Uh, basically just like a lot of using women as like just victims in this volume and that's not what I'm about but I care so I'm gonna keep reading next up we are just inching our way up the scale here we're at 3.6 stars Wow um, this is vinegar girl by Ann Tyler this is a part of the Hogarth Shakespeare series, which are all modern retellings of Shakespeare plays. So yes, I did read two Shakespeare retellings this month, in addition to, spoiler, some actual Shakespeare. We'll get there. Um, this is another shorty. This is fine. I don't know. It's like there were things I liked about it, things I didn't like about it, things I was like, I don't know how to feel about this. Um, it's a retelling of The Taming of the Shrew. I should have said that first. So this is about Kate Batista and her sister Bunny, as if Bianca's not a name that people still have, um, and their father who's a scientist and their scientist father has a um, like a lab assistant who has been with him for three years on this like work visa but he's going to be deported if he can't get this green card renewed or whatever. And so her dad comes up with the brilliant idea of arranging a marriage between Kate and Piotr. Piotr? How you say his name? Uh, so he doesn't get deported. And for the most part, I did not like Piotr, which 
story checks out. Petruchio's the worst. Kate I liked a little bit but also she was a preschool teacher who had no business being a preschool teacher and every scene in this book that involved children made me go oh my god Ann Tyler's never met a four-year-old. <laughs> I we know I don't like age inappropriately written children and this committed that sin. Um, but there were things I liked like Bunny's character development by the end of the book. Bunny was my favorite character and I was like okay you go girl. Uh, what else? I don't know. Oh, I, the the title namesake I really liked. It was the scene um, in which Kate and Piotr were driving in the car and they were talking about just like American sayings and uh, I guess Kate was kind of like being self-deprecating and she was talking about how you know you get more flies with honey than you do with vinegar and Piotr says to her and tell me why would you want to catch flies vinegar girl and I was like Touche, and that was cute, and that's like exactly the kind of fun wordplay that they have in the original play, so I liked that. But overall, I don't know. Like, I wasn't offended by this retelling, but it, it just didn't hit all the right notes for me. It's hard to say, because Shrew is not one of my favorite Shakespeare plays. I am of the camp that it's sexist, so... I don't know, fam. There it is, Vinegar Girl. <laughs> also at 3.6 stars, but one that I enjoyed significantly more, we have Serrano de Bergerac by, oh my god, what is the author's name? French name here. Um, Kara recommended this to me, and I am so glad she did. I definitely, like, was feeling all the feels. I started the play not being so into it. The first act was like really boring in my opinion. The second act didn't do much for me. But once all the interactions between Serrano and Christian and uh, Roxanne started to happen, I was like really invested. I'm not gonna lie. I started to get a little teary-eyed while reading the end of this play. So there's that. Um, if you don't know Serrano de Bergerac, you might know the movie Roxanne or the awful new movie, Roxy, is it hashtag Roxy? Um, it's basically about a man named Serrano who has a large nose and he is in love with his cousin, which I've had to say two months in a row now. <laughs> you know you read classics when you talk about people being in love with their cousins. Um, that was okay back then. And he is afraid to admit this, so when Roxanne confesses that she has feelings for this new soldier guy, Christian, he's like, well, listen, I'll help you be smooth and talk to her because I've got such a great way with words and she'll love your handsome face and she'll love what you're saying, even though it's what I'm saying. And I can just like get all my feelings out and it'll be fine. And you're my friend. So I'm like, cool with this. It's a really weird love triangle, to be honest. Um, but it's, it's like sweet. And I love Roxanne. Oh my god, I would love to play her. The way she just like shows up in the middle of the war and she's like, oh, I'm sorry, are you guys starving to death? I brought a picnic. Like, what an icon. Um, but yeah, this play actually had like had a surprising amount of heart to it, which I didn't expect, and good. I like. Next up at 3.8 stars, we have Desdemona by Toni Morrison and Rokia Traore. Also, I was wrong. I read three Shakespeare retellings this month. She's on brand, baby. Um, this is a play and it is a retelling of Othello, which is my favorite Shakespeare tragedy, uh, tied with Romeo and Juliet. Yeah, uh, I love Othello so much. It's a really good play. So you've probably heard of Toni Morrison, Rokia Traore, I keep looking to the side because I wrote down how to say her name because I don't want to butcher it, um, is a Malian songwriter and singer and musician. She's very talented. Look her up on YouTube. I had never heard of her, but I'm like, okay, get it, girl. Um, and so basically this was a collaboration project between them. It's not really a play. It's a work of theater um, in which Desdemona is like in the afterlife telling her life story and her um, her nursemaid, Barbary, 
uh, is like singing to her so hence the songwriter involved um, and I liked it I just felt confused because it was like I couldn't tell <laughs> Tony's stance on any of the characters like I know how I feel about the characters basically the only character in the play that we don't get in Desdemona is Iago which thank god he's the worst um but we see everyone else we see Desdemona we see um her mother who actually isn't even in the play and Othello's mother who isn't in the play we see Barbary who's mentioned in the play but isn't in the play um we see Othello we see Amelia oh, my queen um we see Cassio like there's a bunch of people who are in this play who were featured in the original but it was like the way they were portrayed is like true to the tr true to the original play and then it was like but actually I'm like this and I was thinking this and now I'm acting like this and I'm like I can't tell how you want me to feel about these characters other than Cassio apparently I should not like Cassio <laughs> Sorry, Casio. Tony Morrison's got something against you, buddy. Um, like, I felt like Amelia showed up, and she was very true to character. She's like, don't you remember me? I died at your side. And I was like, yes, that's so Amelia. And then she was like, I didn't stand up for you. I kept my husband's secrets. And I was like, well, n no, you were just kind of used, and it's awful. And Yes, like you said the truth too late, but I don't blame the events of this play on you. Poor Amelia. Oh my god. So there was a lot of that. Um, but I also liked that the characters were complex. Like Desdemona is like, oh my god, Barbary, we totally lived like the same life because as women, like we didn't experience freedom. And Barbary's like, literally, that's not even my name, you just call me that because I'm from Africa and you know nothing about my struggles and with all due respect, shut up. And I was like, valid. So things I liked, things I didn't like, it's a really quick read, so if you're interested, just read it. It'll take you like a half an hour. Okay, finally we are getting up to the creme de la creme here. At 4.3 stars, we have my nonfiction book for the month, A Secret Sisterhood, The Literary Friendships of Jane Austen, Charlotte Bronte, George Eliot, and Virginia Woolf by Emily Midorikawa and Emma Claire Sweeney, and a foreword by Margaret Atwood. Ooh. Um, so this is exactly how it is described. It is chunked up into four sections, and it's about four famous female authors and their friendships with other literary women so um with Jane Austen it's the like governess slash teacher or whatever of her niece um Charlotte Bronte had like a couple of friends but um what's her name Mary Taylor whoever she was I'm obsessed with her now yeah Mary I can't remember if it was like Taylor or Tyler um who like sassed her and would be like hey this book's pretty good but where's the political message it's like same Mary. Um, George Eliot, who is actually like a very consistent pen pal with Harriet Beecher Stowe, who BT dubs, I did not know was a white lady because I'm an idiot. And Virginia Woolf, who um, was friends with her contemporary Catherine Mansfield. So a lot of interesting stuff in here. Honestly, my favorite chapters were probably the latter three. I don't know why the Jane Austen section didn't do much for me. Probably, if I'm being honest, it's because the farther back in history we go, the more these women's lives were like whitewashed by their family and like their letters were destroyed and they were like, people can't know things about our aunt or whoever, you know, our sister, blah, blah, blah. Um, so like a lot of Jane Austen's letters were burned by her sister Cassandra. Thanks, Cassie. Um, and like a lot of her stuff was destroyed by her nephews and it's like... This is why we can't have nice things. So I guess the better informed we were, the better written those sections were. But honestly, the whole thing was really interesting. I learned a lot. Would recommend. Okay, next up, one of these is actually rated lower than that last book, but I needed to talk about them together. So I have Henry VI, part one and two by William Shakespeare. As you can see, I have a lot of thoughts. 
Um, I gave volume one 4.4 stars. Volume two just got a solid four from me um, because honestly, this one was like more my speed. Uh, it had Joan of Arc, which is always a great time. Um, it had just like a lot of cool political machinations, whereas this had an entire act that was a rebellion that I didn't care about and did nothing except I need to find the most iconic, <laughs> like accidentally funny scene of all time. So basically the man who's leading this rebellion, he changes his name so that like he sounds more official or whatever, I don't know. And so he's like, now is Mortimer, lord of this city, blah, 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 blah. And now henceforth it shall be treason for any that calls me other than Lord Mortimer. Like, it's so serious. Immediately after that line, a soldier comes running in. Jack Cade! Jack Cade! Knock him down there! And they killed him. <laughs> I am so sorry to that soldier, but that was so funny to me. So this is my first time ever reading any history plays by Shakespeare, so it's very exciting to me. Um, I can't believe I care about The War of the Roses, which I knew nothing about, and now I'm like, I feel weirdly, <laughs> like, weirdly invested in? I don't know. Um, I am very curious to see where Volume 3 goes, because I'm going to read it this month in March. And I know there are other plays of Shakespeare's that involve the War of the Roses. There's some that actually chronologically take place before these, but were written after these. So that's why I read these first. Um, but yeah, I'm keeping track of a lot of themes. The red tabs are all like War of the Roses foreshadowing and like beginning events. Um, green is like witchcraft because, <laughs> you know, like Joan of Arc and also um, the wife of one of the political characters basically, like, tries to magic her husband into success. It's very Lady Macbeth of her. I'm so proud. Um, the blue tabs are all, like, prophecy, which was really interesting that that was a running theme. Um, and then I started adding these pink tabs for, like, powerful female moments, because, wow, I love Queen Margaret! Wow, I love her! Um, so yeah. These are very interesting. Not too much I can say unless you know about the War of the Roses. I said there's not too much I can say. I feel like I've been talking about them for five minutes. What is the truth? Um, so excited to continue. And finally, we have a five-star book. So both months of this year so far, I've read a five-star book. I want to keep that up. Thank you very much. This is the Great Alone by Kristen Hanna. Oh my god, you guys. I laughed. I cried. Did I laugh? I cried a lot. Um, this is a historical fiction novel about a family in the 1970s who moves to Alaska. It centers around their teenage daughter, Lenny, who is 13 at the beginning of the novel. Then we see her at like 17. Um, and then, is there another time jump? Do we just see her age up? And then, like, in her 20s. Um, it's so good. Um, this does have some really heavy themes. If you are sensitive to abuse and, like, scary survival situations, I wouldn't recommend this for you because Alaska's a harsh place, y'all. Um, but oh my god, I felt every feeling while reading this. I mean, it was like the themes of motherhood and the themes of friendship and the romance in this book it had me bawling my freaking eyes out. Have you ever read a first kiss scene where you got goosebumps? Because I have. <laughs> I was so happy. <laughs> um, I just really like it. I don't know how to explain it. This book is beautiful. It's well written. It's got so many complex relationships. If you like to cry, I highly, highly, highly recommend. And it's got this beautiful cover. Hello, look at this metallic path. Um, so yeah, I definitely now need to read The Nightingale, which is the book that Chris and Hannah, I dare say, is best known for. And also I almost bought another book of hers at Target like two days ago. 
because I was like, ooh, a new cover. It's so pretty because they like re-released it in a much better cover. I digress. So yes, those are the 11 books that I read in the month of February. Wow. So there were a lot in the middle ground, but the ones that I loved, I really, really loved and they made the month worth it. Oh my gosh. If you've read The Great Alone and you have any recommendations about similar stories, I would love to hear them. Also, share with me your most unpopular opinion of the month because <laughs> Boundless Fair is mine. That book is just getting such rave reviews on Goodreads. <laughs> I don't get it, but you do you. Please make sure to like this video or dislike the engagement will still happen regardless. Um, leave a comment and subscribe if you feel so inclined. And you'll see more of me soon. Bye.